From WBUR Boston and NPR, I'm Tom Ashbrook, and this is On Point, with deep concerns rising about how globalization and technology are changing the U.S. economy and what it will mean for American workers, the idea of offering every American a guaranteed basic income is gaining traction in some surprising quarters. Many European countries are already considering it, and an interesting span of Americans, left and right, arguing for its simplicity and fairness, say it's the right solution for our time. This hour on point, what's driving the new interest in promising all Americans a guaranteed basic income? You can join us on air or online, where this conversation is always on, Does a guaranteed income sound utopian to you, timely, too much? Join us anytime at onpointradio.org or on Twitter and Facebook at On Point Radio. We will hear in this hour from a libertarian supporter of the guaranteed income, a high-profile venture capital supporter, and a staunch opponent. We begin in New Orleans with Carl Weiderquist, professor at Georgetown University School of Foreign Service in Qatar, He's co-chair of the Basic Income Earth Network. It's an international group that promotes the basic income idea. Carl Weiderquist, welcome to On Point. Thank you very much for being with us. Hi, Tom. You've been at this for a long time, promoting this idea. You're gaining new supporters. Why is support mounting for this now, Carl? So many different things are happening at once. It's it's hard to say. Uh, it's hard to point it all to one thing. It seems to be a confluence of a lot of different things. One is the Great Recession and how much that pointed out growing inequality in this country and many other countries, where in the United States, we've had enormous economic growth since the 1970s, and only the wealthiest people have shared in that. The average person is has no higher real income now than they did than they did many decades ago or very slightly higher we have we have high unemployment we have high poverty then we have a lot of concern right now for technological unemployment this is a concern that's 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 been around for a long time but right now with things when things like driverless cars seem possible replacing so much of what people do a lot of people are concerned that we just don't need as much human labor as we do and that counts for some of the port and none of it it seems to be activism building on activism a uh, what was it in 2006 in South Africa the representative at a basic income conference from Namibia who was the also the archbishop of the Lutheran Church of Namibia, he's got up on his podium and he said, we've had too much words, 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 we need to do something. And he, he and a group of people in Namibia raised money and had a pilot project in a small village in Namibia to show what a basic income could do if you give it to an entire village of about 900 people. And since then, there have been pilot projects in East Africa, in India, and now, uh, and those were privately funded, but now we're talking about government-funded pilot projects happening in happening uh, across Europe and possibly in Canada. And you've gotten people who've, who've looked at these pilot projects and other things and see people started other things. In Europe, there were two major petition drives a few years ago, one European-wide, which was which was unsuccessful, but raised nearly 400,000 signatures, and one in Switzerland, which raised over 100,000 signatures and was successful and got it on the ballot. And all of these things have together focused on basic in- and focused attention worldwide on basic income. Whether they all stem from one ultimate cause, I don't know, but all those things have brought attention to it. Finland now apparently moving toward a plan that would give every Finn uh, almost $900 a month. At the same time, they would scrap a lot of their existing welfare system, and they just say, look, everybody gets this, and now off you go. Switzerland, as you say, was on the ballot. I believe it got rejected. It was quite a rich thing, like 2800 bucks a month got rejected in October. But France now looking at this. In the U.K., they're talking about this. Am I right? Uh, and Switzerland did not reject it. it um, the ballot initiative will happen, I believe it's in June of 2016. What uh, what happens in Switzerland, Swiss law, and this is, is very weird and very interesting, is that uh, almost two years ago, the petition drive was successful, which that initiated a process where the parliament was supposed to respond and then uh, the exact wording would be put together and we put to the ballot. Now, 
Last October, the parliament responded negative, but the people are yet to vote. The okay. people are going to vote on basic income in Switzerland this summer. You know, I want to ask about how this would actually work in this country. Uh, I can imagine easily a time when people would just roll their eyes. Put this to my grandparents or my parents. Even for me, I have trouble getting my head around some of what this might mean. People thinking, well, what happens to the incentive to work? What does it do to our work ethic and so on? But describe in practical terms, if it were implemented in the United States, what kind of money would we be talking about? How would it actually work? Well, the idea of basic income is to have a certain small income for every person that's sufficient to cover their necessities. And then a, you give a larger income for people that do work. Any work that the community finds useful will be will be paid at a higher rate. That's how Bertrand Russell defined it uh, almost 100 years ago. I mean, by that last part, you just mean traditional work. You'd get a guaranteed income on top of that, work and do whatever you like. That's right. You pay taxes okay. on your work, um, but your work, but you keep your, your guaranteed income. So you've always got a material incentive to take a job if a good job is offered to you. Um, why do this? We've got unemployment now for people who don't have jobs. Uh, yes, the job market has become very tough to uh, navigate for many people, but people are doing it. Uh, this sounds very expensive. Tell me if I'm wrong. You need to do this because we have poverty in the richest country in the world, and all the richest countries in the world have poverty. Um, and the ones that are closest to the basic income model, the North Nordic countries, are the ones that have least poverty. It is unacceptable that we use destitution and poverty and homelessness as an incentive to get people to work. If you want somebody to work for you, pay them a wage that makes them want to work for you. Don't starve them to death and then say, well, you cannot use any of the resources of the earth to to keep yourself alive till tomorrow unless you do what I tell you. I'm for freedom, and you have to have basic income if you want a society where people are free. That is, though, a big shift in a kind of basic cultural understanding. What is it right there in the Bible? You know, the Adam and Eve cast out of Eden. You will, you will work, you will make your living by the sweat of your brow. I mean, it's a fundamental assumption that work is necessary to social function. Well, when Eve were, and Adam were cast out of the Garden of Eden, uh, there was no ownership to the earth. And they, they had to sweat and work to do it, but they didn't have to take orders. They did not have to go to a boss man and say, oh, I'll do whatever you tell me all day just so I can survive for to, to tonight. Uh, the early humans were, were hunter-gatherers that had the whole world out there that they could, they could hunt, mm -hmm. gather, collect, and, and work with as they wanted to. Um, and even in, in early societies, that was not taken away from them. In the Bible, you have, uh, you have when, uh, when the, the, the kingdom of Israel is established, every family gets a share of the ownership of, of the land of Israel. And every time there's a jubilee, the money goes back to every, or the, the land goes back to every family. So you don't get landless, propertyless people with no choice but to go work for somebody. But now we've created a system where governments and private individuals own all the resources that everyone else needs to survive. And those who don't have any property are put in the position where they have not, not just to work, but they have to work for someone. They have to take orders every day. And forcing a person to take orders just to survive is not right. That's not what freedom is about. Freedom is about we all share this earth. We all get something from the products of this earth. And if you want me to do something for you, pay me a wage on top of what else, whatever else I get that makes it worthwhile for me to do that. We hear the, the philosophy embedded in your view of this. I have to say I'm, I'm reading many different angles from which people are drawn to this lately. Some much more practical, some economists <laughs> saying, look, our economy just won't work when robots start doing everything. We don't have enough paychecks coming down the pike. We're going to have to have some way of sharing that revenue, getting into people's hands for the economy to work. Others saying... The welfare system as we have it is just too inefficient. It has very high embedded costs. Better to just cut checks to everybody and libertarians saying, let's reduce that cost factor. Carl Weiderquist, I'm very glad you're with us. I want to bring in right now as well from Washington, Megan McArdle, economics, business, public policy columnist at Bloomberg View, author of the book, The Upside of Down. Megan McArdle, welcome to On Point. Thanks so much for being with us. Thanks for having me. You have considered this pretty carefully. You come down against it, but do you see why people are thinking about it, Megan, before we get into your objections? 
Of course I do. I mean, you know, there's uh, there's always an appeal to the idea of uh, I mean, people have always liked the idea of not working, right? This is uh, we we used to laud the uh, the aristocrats of Europe because they had this gracious lifestyle that didn't involve having to go out and actually do anything. In you order really to think get that's there. what it boils down to? Leisure, um, laziness. Many people are not well, making I, the argument on that basis. That's a value judgment, right? I mean, is it laziness or, you know, it, you know, uh, I think you're that, not resonating uh, with the libertarians who say, help us save costs on the embedded infrastructure and bureaucracy of welfare. So that's another thing, right? The welfare state is paternalist. As a libertarian, I find it uh, sort of disturbing uh, the ways that it interacts with its ostensible clients. Um, it's expensive. You have to have this enormous bureaucracy. Um, and there's, it would, there is a definite argument that, look, it would be a lot more efficient and much less paternalist if instead of giving people food stamps and health, health care and all of these things, we just gave them enough cash to buy what they want and let them make decisions because they are human beings who have dignity. Um, they don't need daddy. They're adults. They don't need daddy mm-hmm. telling them what they ought to be spending their money on. So why do we have all of these incredibly inefficient and weird transfer programs like food stamps instead of just giving people a straight guaranteed uh, transfer? I absolutely see the appeal. Um, from both an efficiency and an anti-paternalist uh, standpoint. What about the economic argument that the future we're headed into just doesn't have jobs for everyone, but they're going to have to eat? I think that, the, you know, that argument has been made now for literally centuries. And maybe this time is different, right? There is always a point at which arguments that have been wrong in the past turn out to be right now. Um that said, I would not bet that we are going to run out of jobs for people. I think that that's, uh, you know, looking at, first of all, it's not going to happen nearly as fast as people think. And second of all, I'm not sure it's going to happen at any point. At every point that we've thought, oh, well, we no longer have these wonderful weaving jobs, we've come up with something Something new for people to do. I'm Tom Ashbrook. This is On Point. We're talking this hour about the new push for a guaranteed minimum income for all Americans all the time. Sounds radical, but plenty of conservatives are jumping on board with the universal basic income. Not all by any means, and we're hearing that right here today. We'll hear more, but this is an idea who... A interesting span of people are now saying whose time has come. You can join us this hour. What do you think? Does this sound ridiculous to you, utopian, or like an idea whose time has maybe come, is coming? And what if all the other welfare plans went away and everybody was guaranteed a floor? At a time when jobs are so here today and gone tomorrow, the gig economy and all that, do people need this kind of backstop? You heard some of the sound of this in the State of the Union address by the President the other night. This particular proposal, not on the table, but the environment that's leading many to think about it, very much articulated by the President. He talked about how robots, automation, are swinging into many, many jobs now. Today, technology doesn't just replace jobs on the assembly line, but any job where work can be automated. And that's a lot of jobs. The expectation is many, many more going to automation, maybe yours. Where does that leave workers? Here was the president again. Saving for retirement or bouncing back from job loss has gotten a lot tougher. Americans understand that at some point in their careers, in this new economy, they may have to retool, they may have to retrain, but they shouldn't lose what they've already worked so hard to build in the process. The president talking about the uncertainty that appears to be getting more and more baked into the kind of economy we're working with, globalized and technologized all over the place, automated all over the place. Carl Weiderquist is with us from New Orleans today. He's co-chair of the Basic Income Earth Network, uh, co-editor of Basic Income, and uh, with us from New Orleans. Um, Megan McArdle is with us from Bloomberg View, an economics and business columnist there, author of The Upside of Down. Veronique de Rougy joins us right now as well from the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. Kind of conservative outfit there. She's a senior senior research fellow who I believe supports the guaranteed income. Veronique, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you for having me. I understand you to be a libertarian who's for this. Is that true? And if so, why? Uh, I mean, I like the idea. I mean, I would like to say that, you know, I believe that actually markets uh, have proven to be the best way to lift people out of poverty. That being said, we have a we have a big welfare system, and as it is right now, um, 
by design, it is fairly demeaning because it dictates to poor people what they must spend on food and housing and health care rather than letting them make those trade-offs themselves. Um, they, so I think libertarians, uh, by the way, who have uh, been the, the ones proposing uh, this idea for a long time with mm-hmm. Friedman and, and, and Charles Murray and, and Hayek and, and Buchanan, I've always liked this idea of uh, if we're going to have a system, let people be more responsible, a lot of good things would happen of it. It's not a silver bullet by any stretch. First, it's expensive, and, and, uh, and there may be some, um, some work uh, trade off. Um, and, 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 but my, my big concern, the reason why I love the idea I, I, from, from, again, a, a more giving more autonomy, not having bureaucrats in Washington decide and dictate uh, what poor people need at a time where they need it, uh, what, what would I probably stop me from endorsing it in, is that I would want to see having a guarantee that we would replace the entire system. The implementation of it really concerns me. Have you worked the numbers, Veronique? Let's say that somebody would make you that deal. We'll replace the entire existing welfare system and give everyone a guaranteed annual income. Um, I don't know what that income might be. You see everything from a few hundred dollars to a thousand dollars a month uh, or more thrown out there. Is there a reasonable figure for that trade-off uh, that, that where the numbers work, where we could afford it as a country? You know, I haven't done the the the, the I mean, in a while, uh, the the calculation myself. But I, uh, when uh, when Charles Murray looked at it, he was uh, uh, entertaining giving ten thousand dollars to. Uh, every, I mean, it's 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 expensive. If you uh, and when I looked at it, if you give twelve thousand to the two hundred thirty seven million adults at the time, right, it would cost two point eight trillion. Uh, Does now, that sink the ship? Does it sink the ship? Is it doable? Uh, you know, I mean, no, because we're talking about replacing. Absolutely everything, including Medicaid, um, and this is why actually I have a hard time believing uh, that we um, that we're going to uh, have the kind of implementation that would make me comfortable doing it. And also, kind of like the the, the fear uh, for me is you implement a system like this, and how do you make sure that they don't bring back one after the other the other programs? Right. This is how you don't sink the ship. Um, what is the reasonable amount? I, I, don't, I don't know. I can't uh, speak uh, intelligently to that. But again, I, I think the idea has an appeal. It's an idea that libertarians have been floating around for a long time um, uh, because it is more humane. It takes a lot of bureaucrats out of the equation. Um, it actually treats uh, poor people um, like, uh, you know, like everyone else uh, and, and but there are implementation concerns. But Rooney, hold, hold the thought. Carl Whitequist, you've thought about this for a long time. How would, let's say the U.S. said, all right, the economy's changing. We buy Carl's argument or other arguments out there. We'll hear from a big venture capitalist who says we're going to need this to keep functioning as an economy, as a society. How could the country pay for it, Carl? Well, uh, there are some very good studies out there. One by economist Charles Clark at St. John's University who finds that the United States could finance everything it's currently doing except for those things that could be obviously uh, replaced by a, by a basic income such as, such as uh, uh, unemployment insurance. Mm-hmm. And, um, but every, absolutely everything else the, the government is doing could finance a, a basic income large enough to eliminate poverty in the United States with a flat income tax rate of less than 39%. Now, think about that. This is the country that is running a military larger than almost the rest of the world's military put together. Um, It's giving away enormous amounts of corporate welfare just to keep businesses happy, giving, spending money we we don't need to spend for stuff we don't need, um, like the production of pennies. And uh, we can afford to do all of that plus a basic income to eliminate poverty for a tax rate of under 39 percent, far less than it was during uh, during the Eisenhower administration, the top rate. 39 percent flat rate and and off it would go. Megan McCardle, I want to get your analysis on the cost of this and more on work ethic and beyond. We have a lot of listeners who want to join us as well. Let's go to Westland, Michigan. Rob, you're on the air. What do you think, Rob? Hi, Tom. Just a comment. I believe it would weaken our most valuable asset, the American work ethic. We need a flat tax. We need that type of reform, but we don't need a basic 
income for everybody with a handout. Someone needs to work to show that we're American. We can't, you come to America to work to, to be Americans. Rob, I, I, I entirely hear you. What if we're headed into an era, you're in Michigan, you've seen what can happen to manufacturing jobs, you see all the automation that's coming. What if automation moves in in such a big way that there just aren't jobs or decent jobs for an awful lot of people? There will always be jobs. It's American work ethic. If it, it, there will be jobs. You have to make the machines. You've got to maintain the machines. The bureaucrats have to be paid for the machines. There's always going to be jobs like that. You've got to... You've got to want to be something. You've got to want to be somebody. I, 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 to, I totally hear that, Robin, and I'm glad you raised it. Let me hold that one. That's a big issue here, and get one more call, if I may. Joseph in Atlanta. Joseph, you're on. Uh, hey, yeah, no, I, I really endorse um, the idea of a basic income, mostly because it's, it simulates full employment. Um, you know, if, How so? It, could it simulate a lot of people sitting around doing nothing? Oh, no, it, it, it simulates full employment, right? So that even if you do have unemployed people... Oh, simulators. Mm -hmm. Exactly, right? Like, so that, you know, you get a lot of the benefits of, of having full employment. In other words, employers have to make jobs worthwhile, mm -hmm. right? Interesting to work. Um, and, you know, because people will now have the option of, of, of not taking a job that's dirty or, or dull or, or dangerous. So it would push uh, up wages, it, you're saying, and, and working conditions. Would that push us more quickly to automation, Joseph? Yeah, no, I mean, that's, I think that's the idea, right? That it, it, it's like a tax on, on carbon, that it, it makes the renewable energy, you know, more, more economically efficient um, and effective. Um, and, and so, it, yeah, it could help accelerate the rising tide of automation, um, and, you know, it's, it's interesting, right? Like, in terms of the history of the basic income, um, you know, the, 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 the social scientists who first kind of articulated it on the basis of it, it morally legitimizes capitalism. Um, and, and, you know, I, I, my, my sense of most of the arguments now is that it's, it's kind of the only stopgap measure which will permit our, our sort of current form of, of economic production to continue in the light of rising automation. So It, it anyway, is interesting that you've got Hayek and Milton Friedman sitting in the background here. Megan McArdle, there, you know, our first caller is about fears for the work ethic and what this would mean to it. But then you see Joseph in Atlanta coming right in and saying, come on, this is a natural evolution. We can do better. And this is a way to do it. Well, look, I think we know a few things about work and leisure. Um, the first thing we know is that being out of work makes people unhappy. And it makes people unhappy, you know, you would think that it's financial. But in fact, studies have been done in places with extremely generous uh, unemployment mm -hmm. benefits where you're pulling 85, 90% of your former mm -hmm. wage for sitting at home. Those people are also unhappy. And interestingly about unemployment, is that it? the unhappiness persists more than other forms of unemployment. So normally, uh, m other forms of unhappiness. So normally when something happens, you get divorced, you are widowed. Um, you see, obviously, a big spike in your unhappiness. And then over about five years, you'll see your happiness return to about where it was before, except for widows whose happiness goes up slightly, which is a little worrying. But you're presuming that with a basic income, people wouldn't work. But perhaps I am will. I am presuming that there would be some number of people who didn't work because we know that experience from welfare, right? We saw that there was, in fact, a, a large number of people who... There, there, it's what uh, economists call like a stock flow problem. So, in fact, most people who went through the welfare system in a given year got out pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Those people would be there for, say, less than 18 months. But the majority of people who were on welfare at any given day were people who had not worked for an average of 18 years. What those kinds of benefits do is they enable some group of people to make rational short-term decisions, which is that looking for a job is unpleasant. It involves a lot of rejection. Uh, you know, you may not have great skills. Yep. Yep. Uh, the job itself may not be good. But those jobs we do know, there's a lot of data showing this. You start at the bottom, you get the work skills you need to get the next job. What if, if this you never get the, that yep. first job, you don't move up, totally which means get it. that you end up with a reserve army of the unemployed. Totally get it. What if this would work the other way? I mean, you know very well, I'm sure, there are perverse incentives now in our welfare system where if you're on welfare and start to work, you can end up a net loser. Whereas here, uh, the people arguing for this say you'd have this guaranteed floor. And then anything you earn from working would be on top of that. So you have nothing to lose by going out and working. People would. Uh, there are absolutely perverse incentives for working more. And that is a big problem. And it's just unfortunately a problem Currently. with means-tested mm -hmm. benefits, right? Mm -hmm. the, 
downside is that the problem with non-means tested benefits is they're extremely expensive and then uh, perversely, they're less generous for the people who need them most. So, I mean, to start off with, 39% flat tax, that's a huge tax. That's an incredibly high tax rate. And we're talking about almost everyone in the country seeing their effective tax rates something like double. So let's just start there. That's a big and Yes, you get some of it back in the basic income, mm-hmm. but you can't get all of it back because there are some people who are currently like near the poverty line. Second of all, the amount of income that we're ta- that most of these plans talk about isn't a poverty. It wouldn't actually push people above the poverty line unless right. they also worked. Which the would be an incentive thing, to work. Right. Well, maybe, or it might be an incentive to live below the poverty line, yeah. um, which we saw with some people on welfare. They chose somewhat rationally in the short term to live below the poverty okay. line rather than okay. to keep working. But the third thing that you see is that, look, a lot of means-tested benefits are that way for a reason. A lot of the – so Medicaid, for example, mm-hmm. right? You can't give everyone $10,000 and replace Medicaid because some people are extremely expensive to insure mm-hmm. and some people aren't. Um, that's why right now we provide Medicaid for free for everyone below 133 percent of the poverty mm-hmm. line, precisely because those people cannot afford any price health insurance that would actually cover them. Well, you're going to get rid of that? No. Well, now we've got Medicaid. So now we're adding on all of this of on top. Right. Right. Um, and when you look at this, what you end up with is that you've got people who make $100,000 a year and are working because they love their job, getting $10,000 a year. And you've got someone at the bottom who used to have more generous benefits, a lot of housing support, fuel oil support, et cetera, who's yep. getting less, which uh, is a little bit crazy. Megan, stand by. Veronique, I know I've just got you for another couple of minutes here. C- can we go back to our caller who sa- who's worried about the work ethic and thinks, you know, this will lead to people just sitting around, taking a basic income and doing nothing. And he's saying, you've got to be something. You've got to be somebody. That's expressed through work. What about that concern, Veronique? You're fo- you you're lean toward I, this, but what about that? I, I mean, I, I agree, actually, with what... Um, Megan has said, uh, for the most part, that really, I mean, some people would not work, and and I also agree with Megan about the benefits of work and the and the uh, the, the problem and and the negative effect and consequences of not working, and and I think that it's wrong to be talking about about an, an alternative minimum income or basic income as a silver bullet. It's uh, when when considered and and somewhat embraced by a libertarian or or whom or conservatives, it, it's mostly as a less, possibly best, less bad alternative to the current system. Even so, if you end up there, what about the work ethic problem? How do you address it? I think, I think it is a problem, and I think Megan is also correct that there is a reason why we have means-tested program. Uh, I mean, it, but even those actually create this incentive program uh, 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 to work. Mm-hmm. And we've seen it with the Earned Income Tax Credit, which uh, creates a lot of actually disincentive to work when you actually look at number of hours worked uh, for, for uh, 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 categories of, of recipients. So they all all, all government programs do this, and, and I think it's also worth uh, saying if you were saying uh, with, with Friedman and, and, and Hayek in the background, I mean, the reality is uh, libertarians and, and free market economists, uh, they would favor uh, uh, less government rather than more, and here we're possibly talking about more. This is why I think it's better to, re- to reframe the debate as, as um, a less bad alternative, and they they are negative uh, consequences, and they are concerned about uh, work uh, incentives. Is it worse than right now? Um, I don't know. I think there are studies that say uh, that goes both ways, and uh, because the reality is is not everyone would stop working. I mean, twelve thousand dollars, let's say, uh, is 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 for a lot of people would not be enough to work. Uh, so, it would not be enough to work. To sorry, to to work, and actually, for some people, it would be enough to not work, and 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 for a, a majority of people, I would be, I believe would be not enough to not work. I mean, they would want to actually supplement that income. Uh, it's just fascinating, Veronique Derugy at the Mercatus Center there at George Mason University. Charles Koch on the board of the Mercatus Center. So you get the, an idea of the politics there, and yet you hear this open ear for all kinds of reasons to this idea. Veronique, I know we have to let you go. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. This On Point podcast is made possible by Squarespace. If you have a passion that you obsess over, if it keeps you up at night, if you live for it, 
you should show it off. With easy-to-use tools and templates, Squarespace websites help you capture every detail of what drives you. Because if it's worth the effort, it's worth showing to the world. Start your free trial today at squarespace.com. When you're ready to purchase, use the one-word offer code ONPOINT to save 10%. You should. Squarespace. I'm Tom Ashbrook. This is On Point. We're talking this hour about the new push for a guaranteed minimum income for all Americans all the time. Sounds radical, but plenty of libertarians, even conservatives, now jumping on board with the universal basic income idea for all kinds of reasons, some old and some new. You can join us this hour. What do you think? What about our work ethic? Would this kill it if basic survival was guaranteed without working? Would this put a floor under Americans in a new globalized, high-tech, automating economy to help them thrive? You can hear this abroad. Uh, Finland moving toward it right now. France is going to be looking very closely at it. Switzerland uh, is going to be voting on it in a national referendum. Now, this summer, back in 2013, advocates of the guaranteed income dumped dumped 8 million five-cent coins, one for each Swiss citizen, outside the Swiss parliament. Uh, they're looking at a referendum on whether to guarantee a basic monthly income of about $2,800 for every Swiss citizen, whether they work or not. Here's the sound of those coins spilling on the pavement and Russian TV's Peter Oliver. In order to try and illustrate their point that Switzerland is such a wealthy country and it has a mountain of money that can be shared out around all of its citizens, what we're seeing right now happening, just over to my right... 15 tons of gold coins poured out onto the Parliament Square here. But it's not just in Europe where you can hear the sound of of this. Listen carefully here. This is Paul Ryan before he became Speaker of the House. This is back in 2014 at the Brookings Institution. Paul Ryan spoke admiringly of a British program that's similar to a guaranteed income. He talked about the importance of having a simpler system to replace a welter of welfare programs. Policymakers are working on a solution to this problem all around. Simplicity. In 2012, Britain produced a far-reaching reform called the universal credit. The government's now putting this idea into practice, and it is going through a rough patch. But the basic concept is very sound. We should learn from their experience. It took six means-tested programs, ranging from housing benefits to income support, and it collapsed into one overall payment. Paul Ryan there. He doesn't actually come to basic income, but you can hear how it's getting closer. It's going in that direction. Carl Weidequist is with us, co-chair of the Basic Income Earth Network. Megan McArdle is with us, columnist for Bloomberg View. We're going to hear in just a moment from venture capitalist Albert Wenger. But a few calls here, if I may first. Mandy in Austin, Texas. Mandy, you're on the air. What do you think? Hi, Tom. Um, I haven't heard anything about this argument before hearing your show, and I'm leaning towards being in favor of it. Why? I personally would like to go to grad school, and it's been delayed because I'm trying to figure out how to make that possible without going into immense debt. Yep. And it's knowing that there would be something that I could fall back on as far as supporting myself financially day to day. I think would be able to make that a better possibility for me and a lot of other people. So I guess long term, I'm seeing a lot of people taking advantage of being able to pursue higher education or programs that would better and better themselves and launch their careers in a direction that would be more beneficial to society in general. So you're not thinking uh, about taking the money and sitting around. You're thinking about using it to actually get an education that would make you more productive. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think a lot of people... I'm 28, and I see a lot of people in my position who would probably do this, the same thing. You, you may be a good example of, uh, of people who would use it well and who, in this current economy, may need it. Uh, everybody talks about the high cost of education. Mandy, I appreciate your call from Austin. Don in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Don, you're on the air. Yes, how does this differ from communism? Where is the incentive to do anything? When the Berlin Wall fell down, East Germany was in a situation was messed up because those people had no worth ethics. Here's my question. How does this differ from communism? Well, let me put it to you. If it, let's say it was, I don't know, 10 grand a year or 12 grand a year, but anything you did above that would get, would buy you a much better lifestyle. Would that leave the incentive there, Don? Or do you think people will be satisfied sitting around with almost nothing, doing nothing? We currently have checks and balances in place for those people who need assistance. 
The problem of it is they get on assistance and they stay there, or they're not incented to go on. So, the, you know, if, if you're unemployed, you've got unemployment insurance. If you get ill or sick at work, you've got workman's comp. But the thing of it is, we have checks and balances right now to make sure that you provide it for. Yep. So where's where the difference between what we have now and saying, here's $10,000 a month, and you can just sit around if, if you want? Don, we've got it, and I'll pick that question straight up. I want to go to Albert Wenger. He joins us from New York, managing partner at the venture capital firm Union Square Ventures. You can link to his blog posts on guaranteed basic income through our website, onpointradio.org. Albert Wenger, thank you very much for joining us today. Hi, Tom. Um, I know you've got a lot to say about this, but if you would, start with our caller, Don, in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. He says, how is this different from communism? Uh, the incentives are all wrong here. Um, this is really actually enabling people to participate in the labor market um, on their own terms, which is a point that caller Joseph made earlier that I think is a very important point. Um, if you have labor that's too cheap, it's actually a disincentive to capital formation and a disincentive to innovation. Explain so that. Reason, what, what, what do you mean? The uh, reason we build better machines mm -hmm. is um, because they let us do things um, that we weren't able to do before. I was just uh, on vacation in India, and uh, there's a lot of really cheap labor still in India. So you see people mowing uh, lawns with like almost with like hedge clippers, basically. Right, right. Um, and it's because it's varying points labor got expensive, that people said, well, gee, we need better machines. And so um, we want to put a floor under everybody because we're getting machines that are radically better than everything, but we want to continue innovating after that. And so um, I think decoupling the, the, the people's basic needs um, uh, from uh, work and taking care of them through a basic income um, will actually make us more innovative, not less innovative. And it will let people, as Mandy pointed out, it will let people uh, figure out things that they want to work on themselves, uh, that they want to research and study or make music. Let me understand your incentives here, though. So you're saying this would make labor more expensive because people have a basic income. Therefore, we need to innovate more, create machines that could do more. Is this just a way to boost your business? You're in venture capital. You're in investing in innovation in those new machines. Is this just self-serving? Well, I... I you know, we love innovation as VCs, absolutely. Yeah. And so we are pro a lot of pro-innovation policies. But I think if you take a step back from that, I think innovation isn't good just for VCs. It's good for humanity. I think the reason we have these amazing things like the Internet and cell phones that, you know, let us um, access the Internet, um, the reason we have these is because as humanity, we have grown knowledge over time. And th I think the thing that's happening is that at varying points, there have been breakthroughs in knowledge that have allowed us to completely restructure how we live. All right, so we started out as hunter-gatherers, as Carl uh, pointed out at the beginning, yep. and then we had this technological breakthrough, a series of breakthroughs called agriculture. And that allowed us to live very differently. It allowed us to form early cities and societies and so forth, and gave us a lot of really important things like early art. And, yep. um, and then, it, then we had a scientific revolution. We had the Enlightenment, and that gave us... Um, early industrial society, which gave us lots of amazing things, including longer lifespans and better health care and so forth. And now we've had one more such breakthrough, and it's digital technologies. And, and they are foundationally different from the technologies that came before them, because computers are not specific machines, they're universal machines. Why does that suggest that a basic income is a good idea in this digital era? Well, because... Um, because this new breakthrough lets us again live differently than we have before, and it lets us live differently by saying that nobody needs to um, do anything other than whatever they want to work on. We have reached that age where people can work on whatever they want to work on, and if for somebody work means playing video games, if that's how they want to spend their time, that's fine. Somebody else is making those video games, and they're going to be happy if that person plays the video game. Albert, Albert so, st stand by for a moment, if you would. Let sure. me put Casey from Sylvania, Georgia, on with you. Casey, you're on the air. Thank you for calling. Hey, thank you. I think this idea is completely disgusted. Um, Mandy, it's not our responsibility to pay for your college. I'm 27 years old. My mom and dad didn't hand me anything. I started my business with $4,000, and now I own three. It's what you make of yourself. No one owes anybody anything else. If you want to move up in America, everyone has that choice. It's in yourself. It's not based on the government and what someone can hand you, okay? 
You need to go out and make it. If you do not want to be in debt, buy the Dave Ramsey program and learn how to get yourself out of that. Casey, let me take that and put it right to our venture capitalist. So like you, he's a capitalist, a venture capitalist. Uh, Albert, there it is. This is disgusting. Go out and make something of yourself. This is a bad idea. Well, I, I think the question to Casey is, Casey, who paid for your education? Casey, where did the knowledge come from in the textbooks that you read? Where did the infrastructure come from that you make your phone call for your business for? It's not like we are all doing this all by ourselves from zero. We have, we're standing on the shoulders of the collective innovation of humankind over thousands of years. So, like, this idea that anybody creates anything ex nihilo, including you, Casey, I, I think that's just... That's the wrong idea. Casey, I don't know if that's going to satisfy you, but there is an answer. Uh, uh, Dan in Mount Pulaski, Illinois. Dan, you're on the air. Yeah, I'd like to remind you back uh, when uh, great conservative Richard Nixon was in office, he had an advisor, a great liberal, Daniel Patrick Moynihan. They sent a message to Congress about a guaranteed annual income, and that message was rejected by senators like Senator Eastland from the South, Senator Eastland was doing, willing to do anything to help the American people unless they were African Americans. And I hear a lot of Senator Eastland's racist, I hear echoes of Senator Eastland in some of these comments now that are against a guaranteed annual income. Dan, I appreciate your call. Carl Weiderquist, is that right? Was Richard Nixon really floating this idea all the way back in his presidential time? He floated something like it. It was uh, it was more based on the negative income tax model, which is which is a way of putting a floor under under people's income without giving an income to absolutely everyone. The technical differences really aren't that important. There were some other conditional things that made it a little bit farther. But, yes, it was an enormous step. It was called the Family Assistance Program. It was an enormous step towards a basic income. It passed the House of Representatives twice, and it was defeated very narrowly in the Senate. It was the Senate. It was a very, it was a very popular idea at the time. And um, the, the uh, caller is exactly right. There was a southern senator that I don't know if it was Eastland or if it was Senator Long, uh, who, uh, who said, if we have this, who's going to iron my shirts? And that, I think, is something about this, this, this idea of a, of a work ethic idea, is that if you want a work ethic, um, you've got, to, if you really want an economy based on the work ethic, you've got to take capitalism and throw it in the trash, because that's not what capitalism is. And I'm a capitalist, too. I own 14 houses, thanks to I make a good salary and I'm investing that money, a lot of lucky circumstances. I do not work for those houses. I just collect money and I reinvest the money. If you have money, the system will award you with more money. Now, some of that money, you can say, is made out of your efforts. But the rich people of this earth did not invent the earth. They did not invent the land and the resources that are on that earth, yet they own them. And they want to be paid for them. And then they want, a, and some of them at least, some of them want for something for nothing, is they want to have pay to pay nothing for the duty they impose on everyone else. Whenever you say, this is my property, you are, this, this, this resource is my property, you're putting a duty on everyone else to respect that. When that duty wasn't there for, before, for millions of years, we had no such duty well, to I can hear our Iowa listeners rights. shaking his head and saying, yes, this guy is a communist, Carl. <laughs> That's, well, the difference between this and com- communism is the idea that we'd all be better off if, if, one, if one dictator owned everything. That is, that, this is really very far from communism. Com- um, capitalism is where rich people own everything and they tell the poor what to do. Communism is when a dictator owns everything and they tell the poor what to do. A basic income society is where no one can tell someone else what to do. It's a society based on freedom. It's that we all have equal right to this earth and, and nobody owes anybody else anything. And if you're going to take part of this earth, then you got to owe, you got to pay somebody else back for it. They don't have to give you the earth for free and they don't have to give you your labor for free. We, we, if you we, want we, them to work for you, yeah. give them a good offer. Give them a good job. We've got it. Megan McArdle, as a libertarian, that must pluck some of the strings <laughs> in your heart. But what about the social contract here? I mean, you hear Albert Wenger says, we are in a new age, a digital age. This is not only possible, but this is actually preferable because it will drive innovation. And anyway, the, the facts on the ground have changed. What about the social contract in the, the economy that we're moving into? I think there was a lot of there's a lot of interesting stuff that's been said and two words that are missing in all of this discussion. Mm. 
reciprocity, and immigration. And I think those are two really important concepts that you cannot discuss this. That reciprocity, who's going to pay for my so, income, you mean? Well, look, you know, I, I think hunter-gatherers are fascinating, but I think that the picture we've been painting is a little bit uh, gauzy and not actually how their societies work. Yes, hunter-gatherers don't have property. You know what they have? They have extremely strong reciprocity rights. Mm. I do something for you. You have obligations then to help me out yep. later. Yep. What we're actually, I mean, and yet what we're posing is an idea of the universal basic income where only one side has obligations, where people have a right to get something so precisely so that they will be freed from any obligation to give their labor in exchange. Our time for is growing it. painfully short. Go briefly to immigration, Megan. The other thing about immigration is, look, I'll come to you, Robert. The, the greatest poverty poverty reducing program in the history of the world is the U.S. immigration program. This is absolutely incompatible with wide immigration in the U.S. You mean There's we'll no shut it down because more citizens are made, that's more people to pay, that's and That's more it, people it you got to pay for, and those people do not, on average, our low-skilled immigration does not, on average, it doesn't pay for itself. So uh, if you, if everyone who comes in, their kid is entitled to $12,000 a year, politically, that's going to be a non-starter. I would much rather have immigration as a incredible poverty re- reducer than a universal basic income. Albert Wenger, we just got a minute here. You get the last word, I guess. I, I think the reciprocity argument, um, people provide lots of reciprocity by being, by following the laws, by being good citizens. Um, so people contribute to society in many different ways. Somebody who records a YouTube video and puts it out there of themselves playing music makes a contribution. There's lots of ways of having reciprocity. The idea that the only form of reciprocity is returning your labor to society, I think is very, too, it's far too limiting a view. The thing that, we'll, that we're short on and that we need more of is we need more knowledge in the world and knowledge broadly defined including the arts. So. I totally agree that we won't run out of things to do. People will not be sitting around lazily, by and large. People will contribute to knowledge, and that will be good for humanity. Um, That's the contribution we want from people. That's the reciprocity we want, and I think we'll also get that from immigrants. Well, we're just cracking this open today, but dear listeners, listen for the sound of this. I think you're going to hear more as as, as the years roll ahead right here. Albert Wenger with Union Square Ventures. Carl Weiderquist with the Basic Income Earth Network. Megan McArdle with Bloomberg View. Our great thanks to each of you. I'm Tom Ashbrook. This is On Point.